Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe Chapter 5 Builds a House The Journal September 30th, 1659 I, poor, miserable Robinson Crusoe, being shipwrecked during a dreadful storm in the offing, came on shore on this dismal, unfortunate island which I call the Island of Despair. All the rest of the ship's company being drowned, and myself almost dead. All the rest of the day I spent in afflicting myself at the dismal circumstances I was brought to. That is, I had neither food, house, clothes, weapon, nor place to fly to. And in despair of any relief, saw nothing but death before me, either that I should be devoured by wild beasts, murdered by savages, or starved to death for want of food. At the approach of night, I slept in a tree for fear of wild creatures, but slept soundly, though it rained all night. October 1st. In the morning I saw, to my great surprise, the ship had floated with the high tide and was driven on shore again, much nearer the island, which, as it was some comfort on one hand, for seeing her set up right and not broken to pieces, I hoped, if the wind abated, I might get on board and get some food and necessaries out of her for my relief. So, on the other hand, it renewed my grief at the loss of my comrades, who, I imagined, if we had stayed on board, might have sh saved the ship, or, at least, that they would not have been all drowned as they were, and that, had the men been saved, we might perhaps have built us a boat out of the ruins of the ship to have carried us to some other part of the world. I spent great part of this day in perplexing myself on these things, but, at length, seeing the ship almost dry, I went upon the sand as near as I could, and then swam on board. This day also it continued raining, though with no wind at all. From the 1st of October to the 24th, all of these days entirely spent in my several voyages to get all I could out of the ship, which I brought on shore every tide of flood upon rafts. Much rain also in the days, though with some intervals of fair weather, but it seems this was the rainy season. October 20th. I overset my raft and all the goods I had got upon it, but being in shoal water, and the things being chiefly heavy, I recovered many of them when the tide was out. October 25th. It rained all night and all day, with some gusts of wind, during which time the ship broke in pieces, the wind blowing a little harder than before, and was no more to be seen except the wreck of her, and that only at low water. I spent this day in covering and securing the goods which I had saved, that the rain might not spoil them. October 26th. I walked about the shore almost all day to find out a place to fix my habitation, greatly concerned to secure myself from any attack in the night, either from wild beasts or men. Towards night, I fixed upon a proper place under a rock and marked out a semicircle for my encampment, which I resolved to strengthen with a work, wall, or fortification made of double piles lined within with cables and without with turf. From the 26th to the 30th, I worked very hard in carrying all my goods to my new habitation, though some part of the time it rained exceedingly hard. The 31st in the morning, I went out into the island with my gun to seek for some food and discover the country. When I killed a she-goat and her kid followed me home, which I afterwards killed also because it would not feed. November 1st. 
I set up my tent under a rock and lay there for the first night, making it as large as I could with stakes driven in to swing my hammock upon. November 2nd. I set up all my chests and boards and the pieces of timber which made my rafts, and with them formed a fence round me, a little within the place I had marked out for my fortification. November 3rd. I went out with my gun and killed two fowls like ducks, which were very good food, and in the afternoon went to work to make me a table. November 4th. This morning I began to order my times of work, of going out with my gun, time of sleep, and time of diversion, that is, every morning I walked out with my gun for two or three hours, if it did not rain, then employed myself to work till about eleven o'clock, then eat what I had to live on, and from twelve to two I lay down to sleep, the weather being excessively hot and then in the evening to work again. The working part of this day and of the next were wholly employed in making my table, for I was yet but a very sorry workman, though time and necessity made me a complete natural mechanic soon after, as I believe they would do anyone else. November 5th. This day went abroad with my gun and my dog and killed a wild cat her skin pretty soft, but her flesh good for nothing. Every creature that I killed I took of the skins and preserved them. Coming back to the seashore, I saw many sorts of sea fowls, which I did not understand, but was surprised and almost frightened with two or three seals, which, while I was gazing at, not well knowing what they were, got into the sea and escaped me for that time. November 6th. After my morning walk, I went to work with my table again and finished it, though not by my liking. Nor was it long before I learned to mend it. November 7th. Now it began to be settled fair weather. The 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th, and part of the 12th and the 11th was Sunday. I took wholly up to make me a chair and with much ado brought it to a tolerable shape, but never to please me, and even in the, in the making I pulled it in pieces several times. Note, I soon neglected my keeping Sundays, for omitting my mark for them on my post, I forgot which was which. November 13th. This day it rained, which refreshed me exceedingly, and cooled the earth, but it was accompanied with terrible thunder and lightning, which frightened me dreadfully, for fear of my powder. As soon as it was over, I resolved to separate my stock of powder into as many little parcels as possible, that it might not be in danger. November 14th, 15th, and 16th. These three days I spent in making little square chests or boxes, which might hold about a pound or two pounds at most of powder. And so, putting the powder in, I stowed it in places as secure and remote from one another as possible. On one of these three days, I killed a large bird that was good to eat, but I knew not what to call it. November 17th. This day I began to dig behind my tent into the rock to make room for my further conveniency. Note. Three things I wanted exceedingly for this work, that is, a pickaxe, a shovel, and a wheelbarrow, or basket. So I desisted from my work and began to consider how to, to supply that want and make me some tools. As for the pickaxe, I made use of the iron crows which were proper enough, though heavy. But the next thing was a shovel or spade. This was so absolutely necessary that, indeed, I could do nothing effectually without it. But what kind of one to make I knew not. November 18th. The next day, in searching the woods, I found a tree of that wood, or like it, which in the Brazils they call the iron tree, for its exceeding hardness. 
Of this, with great labor, and almost spoiling my axe, I cut a piece and brought it home, too, with difficulty enough, for it was exceedingly heavy. The excessive hardness of the wood, and my having no other way, made me a long while upon this machine, for I worked it effectually by little and little, into the form of a shovel or spade, the handle exactly shaped like ours in England, only that the board part, having no iron shod upon it at the bottom, it would not last me for so long. However, it served well enough for the uses which I had occasion to put it to, but never was a shovel, I believe, made after that fashion, or so long in making. I was still deficient, for I wanted a basket or a wheelbarrow. A basket I could not make by any means, having no such things as twigs that would bend to make wickerware, at least none yet found out, and as to a wheelbarrow, I fancied I could make all but the wheel, but that I had no notion of, neither did I know how to go about it. Besides, I had no possible way to make the iron gudgeons for the spindle or axis of the wheel to run in. So I gave it over, and so for carrying away the earth which I dug out of the cave, I made me a thing like a hod which the laborers carry mortar in when they serve the bricklayers. This is not so difficult to me as the making of the shovel, and yet this and the shovel, and the attempt which I made in vain to make a wheelbarrow, took me, took me up no less than four days. I mean, always excepting my morning walk with my gun, which I seldom failed, and very seldom failed also bringing home something fit to eat. November 23rd. My other work having now stood still because of my making these tools, when they were finished I went on, and working every day, as my strength and time allowed, I spent eighteen days entirely in widening and deepening my cave, that it might hold my goods commodiously. Note. During all this time, I worked to make this room or cave spacious enough to accommodate me as a warehouse or magazine, a kitchen, a dining room, and a cellar. As for my lodging, I kept to the tent, except that sometimes in the wet season of the year it rained so hard that I could not keep myself dry, which caused me afterwards to cover all my place within my pail with long poles in the form of rafters, leaning against the rock, and load them with flags and large leaves of trees, like a thatch. December 10th. I began now to think my cave or vault finished, when, on a sudden, it seems I had made it too large, a great quantity of earth fell down from the top on one side, so much that, in short, it frighted me, and not without reason, too, for... If I had been under it, I had never wanted a grave digger. I had now a great deal of work to do over again, for I had the loosed earth all to carry out, and, which was of more importance, I had the ceiling to prop up, so that I might be sure no more would come down. December 11th. This day I went to work with it accordingly, and got two shores or posts, pitched upright to the top with two pieces of boards across over each post. This I finished the next day, and setting more posts up with boards, in about a week more, I had the roof secured, and the posts standing in rows served me for partitions to part off the house. December 17th. From this day to the 20th I placed shelves and knocked up nails on the posts to hang everything up that could be hung up, and now I began to be in some order within doors. December 20th. Now I carried everything into the cave and began to furnish my house, and set up some pieces of boards like a dresser to order my victuals upon. But boards began to be very scarce with me. Also, I made me another table. 
December 24th. Much rain all day and all night. No stirring out. December 25th. Rain all day. December 26th. No rain and the earth much cooler than before and pleasanter. December 27th. Killed a young goat and lamed another so that I caught it and led it home in a string and when I had it at home I bound and splintered up its leg which was broke. Note bene. I took such care of it that it lived and the leg grew well and as strong as ever but by my nursing it so long it grew tame and fed upon the little green at my door and would not go away. This was the first time that I entertained a thought of breeding up some tame creatures that I might have food when my powder and shot was all spent. December 28th, 29th, 30th, and 31st. Great heats and no breeze, so that there was no stirring abroad except in the evening for food. This time I spent in putting all my things in order within doors. January 1st. Very hot still, but I went abroad early and late with my gun and lay still in the middle of the day. This evening, going farther into the valleys, which lay towards the center of the island, I found there were plenty of goats, though exceedingly shy and hard to come at. However, I resolved to try if I could not bring my dog to hunt them down. January 2nd. Accordingly, the next day I went out with my dog and set him upon the goats, but I was mistaken, for they all faced about upon the dog, and he knew his danger too well, for he would not come near them. January 3rd. I began my fence or wall, which, being still jealous of my being attacked by somebody, I resolved to make very thick and strong. Note bene. This wall being described before, I purposely omit what was said in the journal. It is sufficient to observe that I was no less time than from the 2nd of January to the 14th of April working, finishing, and perfecting this wall, though it was no more than about 24 yards in length, being a half circle from one place in the rock to another place, about 8 yards from it, the door of the cave being in the center behind it. All this time I worked very hard, the rains hindering me many days, nay, sometimes weeks together, but I thought I should never be perfectly secure till this wall was finished, and it is scarce credible what inexpressible labor everything was done with, especially the bringing of piles out of the woods and driving them into the ground, for I made them much bigger than I needed to have done. When this wall was finished, and the outside double fenced, with a turf wall raised up close to it, I perceived myself that if any people were to come on shore there, they would not perceive anything like a habitation, and it was very well I did so, as may be observed hereafter, upon a very remarkable occasion. During this time I made my rounds in the woods for game every day, when the rain permitted me, and made frequent discoveries in these walks of something or other to my advantage. Particularly, I found a kind of wild pigeons which build not as wood pigeons in a tree, but rather as house pigeons in the holes of the rocks, and taking some young ones, I endeavored to bring them up tame, and did so. But when they grew older, they flew away, which perhaps was at first for want of feeding them, for I had nothing to give them. However, I frequently found their nests and got their young ones, which were very good meat. And now, in the managing of my household affairs, I found myself wanting in many things, which I thought at first it was impossible for me to make, as indeed with some of them it was, for instance, I could never make a cask to be hooped. I had a small 
runlet or two, as I observed before, but I could not ever arrive at the capacity of making one by them, though I spent many weeks about it. I could never put in the heads or join the staves so true to one another as to make them hold water. So I gave that also over. In the next place, I was at a great loss for candles, so that as soon as ever it was dark, which was generally by seven o'clock, I was obliged to go to bed. I remembered the lump of beeswax with which I made candles in my African adventure, but I had none of that now. The only remedy I had was that when I killed a goat, I saved the tallow, which with a little dish made of clay, which I baked up in the sun, and to which I added a wick of some, some oakum, I made me a lamp. And this gave me light, though not a clear steady light like a candle. In the middle of all my labors it happened that, rummaging my things, I found a little bag, which, as I hinted before, had been filled with corn for the feeding of poultry. Not for this voyage, but before, as I suppose, when the ship came from Lisbon. The little remainder of corn that had been in the bag was all devoured by the rats, and I saw nothing in the bag but husks and dust. And being willing to have the bag for some other use, I think it was to put my powder in when I divided it for fear of the lightning, or some such use, I shook the husks of corn out of it on one side of my fortification under the rock. It was a little before the great rains just now mentioned that I threw this stuff away, taking no notice, and not so much as remembering that I had thrown anything there, when about a month after, or thereabouts, I saw some few stalks of something green shooting out of the ground, which I fancied might be some plant I had not seen, but I was surprised and perfectly astonished when, after a little longer time, I saw about ten or twelve ears come out, which were perfect green barley, of the same kind as our European, nay, as our English barley. It is impossible to express the astonishment and confusion of my thoughts on this occasion. I had hitherto acted upon no religious foundation at all. Indeed, I had very few notions of religion in my head nor had entertained any sense of anything that had befallen me otherwise than as chance, or as we lightly say, what pleases God, without so much as inquiring into the end of providence in these things, or his order in governing events for the world. But after I saw barley growing there, in a climate which I knew was not proper for corn, and especially that I knew not how it came there, it startled me strangely, and I began to suggest that God had miraculously caused his grain to grow without any help of seed sown, and that it was so directed purely for my sustenance on that wild, miserable place. This touched my heart a little, and brought tears out of my eyes, and I began to bless myself that such a prodigy of nature should happen upon my account. And this was the more strange to me, because I saw near it still, all along by the side of the rock, some other straggling stalks, which proved to be stalks of rice, in which I knew, because I had seen it grow in Africa when I was ashore there. I not only thought these the pure productions of providence for my support, but not doubting that there was more in the place, I went all over that part of the island where I had been before, peering in every corner and under every rock to see for more of it, but I could not find any. At last it occurred to my thoughts that I shook a bag of chicken's meat out in that place, and then the wonder began to cease and I must confess my religious thankfulness to God's providence, began to abate, too, upon the discovering that all this was nothing but what was common, though I ought to have been as thankful for so strange and unforeseen a providence as if it had been miraculous, for it was really the work of providence to me 
that should order or appoint that 10 or 12 grains of corn should remain unspoiled when the rats had destroyed all the rest, as if it had been dropped from heaven, as also that I should throw it out in that particular place where it being in the shade of a high rock, it sprang up immediately, whereas if I had thrown it anywhere else at that time, it had been burnt up and destroyed. I carefully saved the ears of this corn, you may be sure, in their season, which was about the end of June, and laying up every corn, I resolved to sow them all again, hoping in time to have some quantity sufficient to supply me with bread. But it was not till the fourth year that I could allow myself the least grain of this corn to eat, and even then but sparingly, as I shall say afterwards in its order, for I lost all that I sowed the first season by not observing the proper time, for I sowed it just before the dry season so that it never came up at all, at least not as it would have done, of which in its place. Besides this barley, there were, as above, twenty or thirty stalks of rice which I preserved with the same care and for the same use, or to the same purpose, to make me bread, or rather food, for I found ways to cook it without baking, though I did that also after some time. But to return to my journal. I worked excessive hard these three or four months to get my wall done, and the 14th of April I closed it up, contriving to go into it, not by a door, but over the wall, by a ladder, that there might be no sign on the outside of my habitation. April 16th. I finished my ladder, so I went up the ladder to the top and then pulled it up after me and let it down in the inside. This was a complete enclosure to me, for within I had room enough, and nothing could come at me from without, unless it could first mount my wall. The very next day, after this wall was finished, I had almost all my labor overthrown at once, and myself killed. The case was this. As I was busy in the inside, behind my tent, just at the entrance into my cave, I was terribly frighted with a most dreadful surprising thing indeed, for all of a sudden I found the earth come crumbling down from the roof of my cave, and from the edge of the hill over my head, and two of the posts I had set up in the cave cracked in a frightful manner. I was heartily scared, but thought nothing of it, of what was really the cause, only thinking that the top of my cave had fallen in as some of it had done before, and, for fear I should be buried in it, I ran forward to my ladder, and not thinking myself safe there neither, I got over my wall for fear of the pieces of the hill which I expected might roll down upon me. I had no sooner stepped to ground than I plainly saw it was a terrible earthquake, for the ground I stood on shook three times at about eight minutes' distance with three such shocks as would have overturned the strongest building that could be supposed to have stood on the earth, and a great piece of the top of a rock, which stood about half a mile from me, next to the sea, fell down with such a terrible noise as I never heard in all my life. I perceived also the very sea was put into violent motion by it, and I believe the shocks were stronger under the water than on the island. I was so much amazed with the thing itself, having never felt the like, nor discoursed with any one that had, that I was like one dead or stupefied, and the motion of the earth made my stomach sick, like one that was tossed at sea. But the noise of the falling of the rock awakened me, as it were, and rousing me from the stupefied condition I was in, filled me with horror. And I thought of nothing then but the hill falling upon my tent, and all my household goods, and bearing all at once, and this sunk my very soul within me a second time. After the third shock was over, and I felt no more for some time, 
I began to take courage, and yet I had not heart enough to go over my wall again, for fear of being buried alive, but sat still upon the ground, greatly cast down and disconsolate, not knowing what to do. All this while I had not the least serious religious thought, nothing but the common, Lord have mercy upon me, and when it was over, that went away too. While I sat thus, I found the air overcast and grow cloudy, and as if it would rain. Soon after that, the wind arose by little and little, so that in less than half an hour it blew a most dreadful hurricane. The sea was all of a sudden covered over with foam and froth. The shore was covered with the breach of the water. The trees were torn up by the roots, and a terrible storm it was. This held about three hours, and then began to abate, and in two hours more it was quite calm and began to rain very hard. All this while I sat upon the ground very much terrified and dejected, when on a sudden it came into my thoughts that these winds and rain being the consequences of the earthquake, the earthquake itself was spent and over, and I might venture into my cave again. With this thought, my spirits began to revive, and, the rain also helping to persuade me, I went in and sat down in my tent. But the rain was so violent that my tent was ready to be beaten down with it, and I was forced to go into my cave, though very much afraid and uneasy for fear it would fall on my head. This violent rain forced me to a new work, that is, to cut a hole through my new fortification like a sink, to let the water go out, which would else have flooded my cave. After I had been in my cave for some time, and found still no more shocks of the earthquake follow, I began to be more composed, and now to support my spirits, which indeed wanted it very much, I went to my little store and took a small sup of rum, which, however, I did then, and always very sparingly, knowing I could have no more when that was gone. It continued raining all that night and great part of the day, so that I could not stir abroad. But my mind being more composed, I began to think of what I had best do, concluding that if the island was subject to these earthquakes, there would be no living for me in the cave, but I must consider of building a little hut in an open space which I might surround with a wall, as I had done before, and so make myself secure from wild beasts or men. For, I concluded, if I stayed where I was, I should certainly one time or other be buried alive. With these thoughts, I resolved to remove my tent from the place where it stood, which was just under the hanging precipice, of the hill, and which, if it should be shaken again, would certainly fall upon my tent, and I spent the next two days, being the 19th and 20th of April, in contriving where and how to remove my habitation. The fear of being swallowed up alive made me that I never slept in quiet, and yet the apprehension of lying abroad without any fence was almost equal to it. But still, when I looked about and saw how everything was put in order, how pleasantly concealed I was, and how safe from danger, it made me very loath to remove. In the meantime, it occurred to me that it would require a vast deal of time for me to do this, and that I must be contented to venture where I was, till I had formed a camp for myself and had secured it so as to remove to it. So with this resolution I composed myself for a time, and resolved that I would go to work with all speed to build me a wall with piles and cables, etc., in a circle, as before, and set my tent up in it when it was finished, but that I would venture to stay where I was till it was finished, and fit to remove. This was the 21st. April 22nd. The next morning I began to consider of means to put this resolve into execution, 
but I was at a great loss about my tools. I had three large axes and abundance of hatchets, for we carried the hatchets for traffic with the Indians, but with much chopping and cutting knotty hard wood, they were all full of notches and dull, and though I had a grindstone, I could not turn it and grind my tools too. This cost me as much thought as a statesman would have bestowed upon a grand point of politics, or a judge upon the life and death of a man. At length I contrived a wheel with the string to turn it with my foot, that I might have both my hands at liberty. Note. I had never seen any such thing in England, or at least not to take notice how it was done, though since I have observed it is very common there, besides that my grindstone was very heavy and large. This machine cost me a full week's work to bring it to, per to perfection. April 28th and 29th These two whole days I took up in grinding my tools, my machine for turning, my grindstone performing very well. April 30th Having perceived my bread had been low a great while, now I took a survey of it and reduced myself to one biscuit cake a day, which made my heart very heavy. May 1st. In the morning, looking towards the seaside, the tide being low, I saw something lie on the shore bigger than ordinary, and it looked like a cask. When I came to it, I found a small barrel and two or three pieces of the wreck of the ship, which were driven on shore by the late hurricane, and looking towards the wreck itself, I thought it seemed to lie higher out of the water than it used to. I examined the barrel which was driven on shore, and soon found that it was a barrel of gunpowder, but it had taken water and the powder was caked as hard as a stone. However, I rolled it farther on shore for the present, and went on upon the sands, as near as I could to the wreck of the ship, to look for more. End of chapter 5